That was my only demand that we had to have Michael here as the first inaugural Black Bottom Film Festival honoree. He's still working. Uh, for f This is his fourth or fifth decade of working in uh, television and film. And uh, at 78 years old, he's fit and trim and, and rocking and rolling. And he's doing contemporary films and TV shows that are appealing to 15-year-olds. So, I mean, that's how relevant this man is. So without further ado, let's hit the rail. It's only you, no one could ever make me change my mind about us together no matter where i am or how far i'm from where you go just know that you are mine and i am yours forever where have you been yeah my bad i should have called i uh i had a meeting with some investors who pablo escobar so where are we at Working out the choreography. Impress me. If you ever get lost, 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 don't worry at all. I'll come for you because you're all that matters, and we're all that matters when we're. Get in the way. No, 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 no. Not working. What do you mean? It was on point. They were. You're not. I think the essential qualities of a director are the ability to tell stories in a compelling way, great passion for the work because it's really hard work, stamina endurance, insight into human nature, the ability to handle people psychologically because the entire process is one series of relationships after another. Not DJ Runs! My name, Jam Master J, is his. He's DMC. It's like that and that's the way it is. Are you ashamed of me, Dad? And stop calling me Dad. Well, what am I supposed to call you? Well, I don't know. Whitey. Party people in the world try to make it speed. You travel by car, train, bus, or feet. I said you got to work hard if you want to compete. It's like that, and that's the way it's free. Josie Cole. This is Dexter Jackson. That's right. Dexter Jackson. Coming to you live, Jim. Live and <laughs> in living color. See you in the sun. She thinks she's the good black, and she thinks we're the bad black. Preach. How is that what you just heard? That's what I heard. Yes. Yeah, casserole is delicious. It's very beany. All my mom is saying is that there's nothing wrong with having an expanded world view. There is a rich panoply of different ways to experience blackness. Uh, none of which include the words rich panoply. Now, Michael's going to be interviewed by Jermaine Williams, who is the... Uh, recently named CEO of Pittsburgh Filmmakers and Pittsburgh Center for the Arts. So let's give Jermaine a, a big hand, a round of applause as well. Okay, is this on? Okay. This is just amazing, amazing work. Um, I'm really honored to be able to sit here um, with Michael and just kind of understand um, how much he's meant over the last 40, 50 years um, in terms of making um, strong images of African Americans and, and strong images, period, um, and putting them on the screen. So I'm just excited to be here, so thank you. Well, it's great being here. And uh, I have to punch Joe out for telling my age. <laughs> <laughs> Nonviolent. <laughs> Be okay. right. So, so I wanted to really just open up with a couple questions, um, you know, about your early 
early life and, and background. So how did you, um, like where did you grow up and you know, how did you find your way to the theater and to film? Um, I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, so I'm a Midwesterner by, uh, by birth. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a New Yorker by heart, uh, but I live in LA, because uh, <laughs> that's where the work is. Uh, <laughs> I um, had no intention of being in this business at all. Um, when I was growing up, uh, I graduated high school in 1957, and I wanted to be Colin Powell of the Air Force. I wanted to fly jets, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and uh, I, I wasn't thinking about killing people, shooting. I just wanted to fly, mm -hmm. you know. And um, my, my mother, who, who was a, uh, a single mother, she and... and uh, her mother mm -hmm. raised the two of us. I had, I had a brother. And we were always instilled with the thought that we could do anything. Anything was possible. Mm -hmm. And so she would constantly tell us, you know, just be the best at what you choose to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so, <laughs> so the year I graduated high school, they were going to, they, they were taking one person from every state in the union to go to the Air Force Academy. And you had to take all these tests and get a um, recommendation from your congressman. Uh, and I wound up being the second highest person in the state of Wisconsin. Um, so I was the alternate. If the guy who beat me out had chosen not to go, we wouldn't be sitting on this stage different, today. Different I, <laughs> I would have been up in the air somewhere. So um, they gave me an appointment to West Point as a Constellation Prize, but I didn't want to be in the Army. Wow. Okay. Uh, I said, well, they won't let me fly jets. I'll, I'll fly rockets. I'll be an astronaut. Mm -hmm. So I go to the University of Wisconsin in Madison to study astronautical engineering and learn in my freshman year why I only wound up second in the state of Wisconsin. Because <laughs> my, my calculus class was kicking my behind. <laughs> and I looked around and realized, I don't like engineers. Well, calculus, you know, me and math don't get along. Mm -hmm. What am I doing, you know? So I spent my sophomore year kind of taking classes that I was interested in. I took Russian. I took Chinese mm -hmm. uh, because I, I was thinking maybe I'll be a diplomat. Uh, I knew that those two countries would be people that we had to deal with in the future. And I took astronomy and, and my guidance counselor said, well, you can't do that. You know, it's like uh, you got to declare a major. I said, well, who's paying for this? You know, <laughs> I, I'm going to learn what I want to learn. But I spent most of my time in the movie theater, they had a they had a on on campus movie theater that showed all these great filmmakers: Fellini, Bergman, Antonioni, mm -hmm. Lelouch, mm -hmm. great foreign filmmakers who were telling stories that I hadn't seen come out of Hollywood, you know. And I'd sit in the back of the theater saying, "Man, I wish I wish I could do that." We have so many stories that need to be told that are not being told. I, I would just love to do that. And didn't have a clue as to how to get there. It does. It does. <laughs> and so uh, it was at, kind of at that period you slowly transitioned into the theater and kind of getting your... Right. I couldn't afford to go to film school. And there were only three at the time. There was USC, UCLA, and NYU. And this kid from a, a, a working class family, you know, couldn't, couldn't afford that kind of tuition. Okay. Uh, so film school was out of the question. So sitting in the back of that movie theater watching those movies was my film school. Okay. Uh, 
But I said, you know, I really want to do this. Can't afford to go to film school. And a friend of mine said, well, there's a great theater school right here in Milwaukee called Marquette University. Mm -hmm. Go down there and see if you can get in. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, to make a long story short, uh, I got in, but one of the requirements of being in the theater was you had to take acting class, you had to take voice class, you had to take dance class, ballet, et cetera. You had to build sets or make costumes, design lights. Otherwise, you couldn't be in the theater program. And the theater, it, Marquette was a Jesuit university, is a Jesuit university, and they kind of tolerated the theater department. Mm -hmm. They didn't really support it financially. Uh, so if we didn't sell tickets, we couldn't put on the next play. So it was almost like being in an off-Broadway theater where you had to survive by um, getting an audience um, in a university environment. So after two years of doing that program, I went to New York and I could do anything that needed to be done. My directing mentor, they didn't have a directing program, so my directing program was watching him direct the students. He said, if you really want to be a good director, go to New York and act for five years. I hated acting. <laughs> I did not want to be an actor. I felt embarrassed being on stage. Um, and I, I wanted to be behind the footlights, not in front of them. Um, but I followed his advice. I went to New York, got an acting class, just so I could be in the mix. And the guy who was running the acting class was opening a new theater off-Broadway called the American Place Theater. And he offered me a job as an assistant stage manager. And I said, oh, man, how much are you paying? <laughs> good first question. He said, $75 a week. I said, $75 a week? Nobody can live in New York on $75 a week? <laughs> he said, well, you want to be in the theater or not? You know, or you, you want to sell insurance? And my father was an insurance salesman, so I said, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I took the job. And, um, and because I was there in the mix, they needed an actor whose description I fit. Okay. The play was based on the Amistad incident. Okay. Uh, if anybody know what that story is about? Okay. And, uh, uh, and it was written by a famous American poet named Robert Lowell. And so I'm on stage acting with Frank Langella. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I was his understudy. Roscoe Lee Brown. Mark Ryland. So I'm, I'm on stage with all these great New York actors thinking about they shouldn't say the line that way, you know, <laughs> or they should be over here. I'm, I'm supposed to be acting, but I'm in my head, I'm directing, you know, thinking that I can direct the play better than this English guy. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the play went on to win five Obie Awards for the best of everything. And then we cut a record of it, and then we made a TV show out of it and put it on TV, WNET. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, this, this is not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> just kept with it. <laughs> but it took me a year to convince somebody to let me direct the play. Okay. And my theory was if, if I made a rep as a director in theater, somebody would offer me a movie. And... That's essentially what happened. Right, and, and so, and that was your kind of working with um, Lorraine Hansberry's work to be young, gifted, and black. Right, I, I my first off-Broadway play, well, I, I was one of the founding members of the Negro Ensemble Company. Um, Douglas Turner Ward um, uh, wrote an article in the New York Times about the need for a space um, 
to create and develop black artists, actors, okay. directors, playwrights. Okay. And um, the Rockefeller Foundation uh, read the article and said, okay, let's, we'll put some money behind that. And like the foundation that created this space, mm -hmm. um, the Rockefeller created the Negro Ensemble Company okay. off Broadway. And so I directed their first play, won an Obie Award for Best Director of that year. Mm -hmm. And, um, and this is, is 1960? 1969, I think. Okay. Yeah. And then I got my first Broadway play, mm -hmm. hired a young actor named Al Pacino. Uh -huh. <laughs> my wife uh, played the female lead, and the three of us got nominated for Tonys, and uh, Al won the Tony. I lost out to the Great White Hope. <laughs> uh, and... Um, a producer came up to me after one of the performances and said, I'm, I'm doing this little movie called To Be Young, Gifted, and Black. Do you want to direct it? Mm -hmm. I said, does a bear shit in the woods? <laughs> <laughs> right. And, you know, had I known any better, I probably would not have taken the job. So I said, where's the script? Uh, and he said, well, here's the play. Mm -hmm. You make the script. You know, okay. it's like I, I had carte blanche to do whatever I wanted to do and visualizing, you know, how to do, how to transfer a play mm -hmm. to a film. Mm -hmm. and, and what are some of the challenges? So, like, right now we have um, two Oscar-nominated films with Fences and Moonlight that were started as plays. Mm -hmm. Like, what are some of the challenges of kind of making that transition from, from something produced for the stage to, you know, imagining it for the, uh, for the screen. Right. Well, I, th I think between the two, um, Moonlight is a better um, uh, translation mm -hmm. um, as a film, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily a better story, but a better translation from a play to a film. Um, the power of theater is language. Mm -hmm. And the power of film is really movement, it's motion, it's being able to get into, into the um, life of a character without having to do a lot of language. Right. Uh, in theater, it's, you're sitting way in the back row, sometimes it's hard to see what's going on mm -hmm. in, the, in the character's mind. In film, you can take the audience right into the character's mind mm -hmm. without saying a lot of words. So for me, um, although I love the play and love August's work, I think if he were alive, mm -hmm. he and Denzel would have found a way to trim down some of the language, the language. and make it more of a movie. Okay. But the performances that Denzel and Viola give are so riveting. Uh, you know, you don't you don't care that it's, right. it's you stay it's, with them. Yeah, exactly. You you in there, in in their world. Now, were you aware of Lorraine Hansberry's work before? Oh like yeah. When you were at the University of Wisconsin. No. You kind of back in college. University of Wisconsin, all white school. Yeah. You know, it's like we didn't know anything about black anything. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. And so, in, in terms of kind of thinking about um, your career and getting projects made, I think one of the things that's so impressive is the consistency of producing from year to year, producing um, film, television work. Can you just kind of talk about the, the, the challenges in terms of? getting the deal done for a project that you want to move forward? Um, and, well, and, and has it changed from the beginning of your career <laughs> to now? Uh, the, the challenge for any filmmaker, and, and especially a filmmaker of color, um, is finding the funding to tell your story, you know? so. You know, a series of, of um, happenstances or, or lucky, 
yeah, I, I don't really believe in luck. I believe you make your luck, you know. So my entree into getting my first semi-Hollywood movie, which is Cooley High, was work that I did on a film that never got released. And the editor of the film was working with Steve Krantz, who was producing Cooley High, and said, you need to talk to this guy, you know? Um, and that's how I got introduced to Cooley High. But the funding part of it was already handled by the producer. Okay, you know? so that was in place? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so I was a gun for hire okay. for that. And um, <clears throat> uh, when, when filmmakers go out to the distribution institutions, um, you're either going to be lucky to find a friend in court mm -hmm. who's in the, in the distribution pipeline, the studio or the distributor or whatever, who likes the idea, likes the story, thinks that they can sell it to their board okay. um, and become a champion within the studio system for a story that they would not normally do. So Fences um, became a movie because the the play was a big hit. Mm -hmm. The studio thought that they could be successful with it if they put the right team together. Mm -hmm. August said, you're not doing this unless you hire a black right. director. Right. And so it sat for years uh, until Denzel gained enough power and influence mm -hmm. uh, to do that. But the friend in court was the guy who had the rights, um, and I forget his name, but mm -hmm. um, do you know? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who held on to the rights for right. that length of time until, until he could get it made. Right, and it had passed around, you know, the, the rights to be able to do that had passed around a little bit in, in Hollywood. At one point, Eddie Murphy owned it. No, Eddie, Eddie didn't own it, uh, I don't think. I, I think that uh, Eddie was instrumental in getting Paramount to buy it. Okay. Um, or this producer to, to buy it and get it done at Paramount. And then, and Eddie was gonna play the son. Okay. Um, and then, because uh, August stood his ground and said, you know, you gotta find a black, black. director. Right. And didn't move. Yeah. yeah. And they didn't really wanna find a black director at that time, right. yeah. uh, which is my opinion. Uh, so, so it went dormant, and then Eddie w got too old to play the son, mm -hmm. and so he uh, walked away from the project, and then it went dormant, right. you know. Right. Do, do you remember the first time reading the script for, for Cooley High? Oh, yeah, sure. And, and it really, it was a series of really good um, uh, stories, sequences. Uh, Eric Monty was a really good storyteller, but he didn't know how to write a script. Okay. Um, and so Steve Krantz, who happened to be Jewish, uh, was rewriting Eric's work to try and get it, you know, uh, to get a script out of it. Full story arc. Yeah. Course, yeah. And um, so it wasn't quite working as a, as, as a movie. Okay. So I, after I read the script, I, I called Steve Krantz and said, look, I was in New York. I said, I'm coming out to LA um, and I'd like to meet Eric Monty and if I can work with him, I think, you know, uh, we might have something. Okay. And then when I went out to LA, I, I discovered, uh, when I met Eric, he said, well, this is not, all my writing, you know, Steve was trying to rewrite stuff. So I said, oh, that's the problem, okay. <laughs> so so um, I got 
Eric, um, who really didn't have the discipline of a screenwriter, I said, okay, I'm coming over to your house every day, five days a week, I'm hiring a stenographer, we're gonna sit down and tell stories about growing up, uh -huh. you know? Um, and then I would go home after every day and work with my wife and call out, uh, pick the best of the stories, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and after a month's time, we had a we had a script ready to go and then took it to the studio and i got some of the best advice i ever got in the business um the studio exec read it and he said no it's pretty good now go back and rewrite every scene in a way that you haven't ever seen it on screen before <laughs> <laughs> I said, mm, okay, all right. <laughs> and, and I didn't know how to process that note, you know, until um, our youngest son was about uh, a year and a half old, toddler, you know, um, and he was, he was always finding stuff and putting it in the toilet. Okay. And there's this one scene in Cooley High where Cochise, who's the basketball player, is waiting for his letter from the college saying he's been accepted. Right. And the way it was written was he comes in, he asks his aunt you know, where the letter is. She says it's on the dresser. He goes to the dresser and gets it and is all excited that he's been accepted. So taking that note, I said, well, his little brother, which wasn't in the script, uh, could have put it in the toilet, and, he, and that's where he finds it, wow. you know? Wow. Yeah. And, and so I put my son in the movie. <laughs> Let him put the letter in the toilet, you know, and then we shot it. Wow. Uh, and so we kind of rewrote, not every scene, but a lot of the scenes using mm -hmm things that we hadn't seen on screen before. Yeah, and how did the relationship with Motown come up for Cooley High? Um, I, I had been doing something else with uh, Suzanne DePass, mm -hmm. who, who was like Barry Gordy's right-hand person. Right. And um, I can't even remember what it was that we were doing, but while shooting the movie, I was using all this Motown music because it was, music that I grew up with, nobody in the industry w valued the music. And so I went to Suzanne and said, look, I, you know, I, I use this as temp music, but I really want it in the final, it works so well. And I got 17 Motown songs for almost nothing, wow. you know? Wow. wow, and they hadn't been prominent in another film as a soundtrack no. of another film. No. Yeah. Yeah, that's really great. So, and then, you know, because we made a deal with Motown that they didn't get a whole lot of money for those songs, mm -hmm. by the time they invented the VHS, uh, nobody could make a deal with Motown for the music. It was, <laughs> by that time, Motown had blown up. Right, right. And they realized the value uh, of the music, so they were asking for way too much money. Sure. Um, so it took years and years before people could get it on uh, on VHS and wow. DVD. Right, right. So you you've made several films with Richard Pryor, um, and I think you know everyone kind of recognizes Richard as this um, comedic um, genius. Absolutely. And, uh, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, what you learned from Richard Pryor about comedy. Um, you know, just kind of seeing him work as an actor in those different films. Um, what I learned, um, I, don't, I don't know if I learned anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I would just sit back and, uh, sit and, back and watch and, and, watch and yeah. laugh, you yeah. know. Um, I met... Richard, it was very interesting. Um, before I came out to Hollywood to, to really live there and try and get a job, mm -hmm. um, I was in New York 
and, and David Picker ran a company called United Artists. And they had a project um, called Simmons from Chicago. And it, it was a, written by uh, a guy, uh, the only black guy who was one of the creators of the Muppets. Okay. Uh, and uh, it was a comedy about a pimp who becomes president. Uh, pimp, from, pimp from Chicago who becomes president. Okay. <laughs> Not Obama. <laughs> and and they wanted Richard to play the the lead role, and so they sent me to California to meet with Richard, and we sat around and talked, and then discovered we had a lot of uh, things that we wanted to do to get out in the public. Mm -hmm. um, he had written a Western that was a voodoo Western. And, <laughs> and it, it was very serious. And it was wow. called The Black Stranger, you know, and wow. everybody in Hollywood was scared to death of it because, wow. <laughs> because it, it was a, uh, uh, if you remember Pale Rider, the, the Clint Eastwood uh, okay. uh, movie, uh, it was a black hero who was a gunslinger who comes to a town that's been uh, divided by racial hatred and clears up the mess, you know, so people wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, and I, I told him, I'm going to try and get this done. And then the studio, um, when they gave me the budget, it was not going to be adequate enough to make a good movie. Okay. And so I didn't know how to play the Hollywood game at the time. Um, and so I said, if you don't put up enough money to make a movie that uh, I can be proud of, then I'm not interested. Okay. You know? And they said, well, later for you. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> so the movie never got done. And I think Richard really, uh, really was impressed at the fact that I went to the mat to, to get the resources to get the right need. kind of budget right, right. to make the film because I wasn't going to make a piece of crap. Right, so, right. Uh, and, and so we, we formed a, a working relationship. It never was like a friendly friend thing, okay. you know, but we had a really good working relationship. And so, so what were some of the, the takes like? So you know, how, how, how was Richard on, on set in terms of, you know, approaching the roles and... Oh, he, he the, the one thing I learned about um, comedy, good comedy, uh, from Richard, is he was a consummate craftsman. He, when he came on stage, it sounded like it was spontaneous, mm -hmm. but he would, he would hone his comedic uh, presentation w w with a fine tooth comb, you know. Um, and he was as funny off screen as he was on, on camera. Okay. And um, he had a kind of what I call a ESP, a extra sensory perception. He was so sensitive that he could tell kind of what you were thinking and he'd comment on it before you got it out of your mouth, you know? So if it was positive or if it was negative, you know, he would react to it mm -hmm. right away and usually have people falling on the floor with what he'd say, you know? Wow. Uh, but he was a joy to work with. Very creative, very funny. Uh, when I did Which Way Is Up, which I'm, I'm really anxious to see the audience reaction mm -hmm. to that movie in today's time because it's politically incorrect. Yeah. <laughs> but it's politically incorrect for a, a, a good reason. It, it's a morality tale. My hardest job directing that movie mm -hmm. was trying to keep the crew from laughing <laughs> and spoiling the takes yeah. and, and, and his fellow actors. Yeah. He would just have people falling out 
you know, and the actors, there are some takes in the movie where you see the, the actress or the actor trying to hold their face straight, you know, <laughs> because he'd come up with, with uh, something crazy but wonderful, you know, as part of his characters. And my idea for this movie was it was going to be his first leading man role. And I kind of crafted it so that it would take advantage of all those characters he was creating with his stand-up routines that people hadn't seen on film, so I wanted him to play these multiple parts, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So if you, um, I mean, you've, you've done television, work on the stage, made films in Hollywood. Um, you know, as you look at, at black cinema today, um, do you have a, a sense of, of optimism and vibrancy oh, about absolutely. the young, young directors that, that are coming up? Oh. How do you look at the, at the I, field I right think now? it's a great time. Okay. Uh, it's a great time in our history. Uh, there's so much black talent out there uh, that is now getting a chance to uh, surface, um, you know, with the proven success of shows like Blackish, uh, it, it's giving more directors. Even though Kenya Barris, who created the show, has to fight every day with the studio to get this black director or this woman director or whatever, because their tendency is always to say is to be afraid of some new um, element in the formula. Mm -hmm. So in Hollywood, they always want to go with a known quantity, a known quantity. So it's hard for new people to get in the system. Sure. Um, so when um, people like, um, who's the woman who created Scandal? Chandra, yeah. So when Chandra and Kenya become, uh, you know, pr prove that that their stories will bring an audience, an audience to Hollywood means money. Um, then the doors open up. So Chandra was able to get a lot of people in the director's chair. Okay. Um, Kenya is able to get a lot of people in the director's chair. So in the world of television, that's opening up. Uh, in the world of independent cinema, um, Ava DuVernay's success is phenomenal. And the, and the fact that she is socially conscious, that she understands the whole distribution element and has created um, Array, a distribution company for independent cinema, you know, she is totally on the right track. Yeah, that's um, and it's just an exciting time. When a studio like Paramount spends multi-million dollars on promoting a story like Fences, I mean, I've never seen so much advertising. Right. And, and, and they must have spent at least three or four times what the movie costs to make in On promoting it. Wow. And that says a whole lot about the, the effect that the Oscars last year, Oscars So White, mm -hmm. the effect that it had That's on nice. the studios, mm -hmm. because they never would have spent that kind of money, right. you know? Right. Uh, so protests, definitely works. Uh, I probably wouldn't have been able to get in the door uh, at, at Universal Studios if there hadn't been people in the streets protesting about opening up the unions so that so-called minorities and women could get in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if that social movement hadn't been happening, then the system doesn't change. Right. So um, we need to uh, constantly remember that. Yeah, yeah. 
No, that's, a, that's a great thought. So I, I want to open it up to questions, if anyone has questions for Michael. Hi, Michael. Hello. And I salute you for your, your work. My question is, what would you say is important for the audience, particularly the black audience, to be a, a support for independent works? How important is that? Because I go to the saying of, if we want good films, we need good audiences. How would you make the connection of the factor of the audience? Because you spoke about demographics, mm -hmm. and if something, uh, a work has the ability to put people in the, in the theaters, that means something. Right. But what about, it's important that if we want things to change, it's important for the audience to support our artists. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, you know, you, you, you hate, you, you hate to say it, but the uh, if nobody's in the seats, you know, how, how do you pay the rent on this building, you know? Uh, so if we're not attracting an audience, then we're doing something wrong. Um, if the audience doesn't go out of its way to come through, you know, the rain, the rainy day or the snowy day or whatever to um, be a part of the experience, then, you know, it's almost like the elections. <laughs> if, you, if you don't vote, then, then you don't get what you want, you know? If you don't show up, you don't get what you want. It's really that simple. So, and, and the thing about film uh, is you never really know what you're going to see until you get in the theater, you know, and even what people write about it is not necessarily what it is for you. So if you don't have that adventurous spirit to come out and, and experiment and be open to uh, those new stories, then you're not gonna cultivate um, an industry, you know? So I, I think one of the, the things that I've been fortunate enough to be involved in is that I've always find, found a way to incorporate the entertainment factor with hopefully a, a message, you know, with hopefully a story that's worth telling. Um, and because uh, I always felt you got to get the audience, you know, you, you got to make them want to come and see that, you know. Great. Thanks. I have another question here. Yeah. Hi, Michael. Um, so re recently, we're always talking, we had a good conversation last night. Uh, recently, unearthed an interview with Ivan Dixon, you know, who was another pioneer. And, um, you know, he was talking about the compromises that he had to make within the studio system, you know, playing the game or whatever. And, you know, eventually he just walked away. Well, he's in car wash, too, um, so I know you know him. But, um, you know, but he was talking, talk, sharing movies, dream projects, things that he wanted to do that he just couldn't make a way for. Like, what, what are some of the stories that you still want to tell at this point? That I want to tell? Yeah. Um, well, um, Danny Glover and I share a, a, a passion to get the story of the Haitian Revolution done. Mm, yes. um, and <laughs> it's, it's such an incredible window on what we're living through today, you know, um, and, and such an epic um, story that most people don't know and that Hollywood is scared shitless to, to do. Uh, so um, that's one of the things that, uh, before I get too much older, <laughs> uh, 
that I'd like to see uh, get done. Um, there's a wonderful story about um, uh, the guy who wrote The Three Musketeers and the man in the iron mask and um and on and on um his story uh dumas is a great story yeah. that i think even though it's in the past and and in a, a french world mm -hmm. that is uh, inspiring um story kind of like uh, hidden figures, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, when you realize that some of the great work that has been done that you never knew was uh, created by a person of color, you know, that's been kind of put under the rug and hidden from us, uh, you, you realize how uh, what kind of potential we have and how great we are as a people. Okay. You know? Great, great. Other, other questions? Got one here. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, there have been a whole lot of remakes of classic films and some that should have just been left alone. <laughs> Do you ever see a remake of Cooley High or Which Way Is Up or Car Wash for that matter? You know, they're trying to do a remake of Cooley High um, and that Common is involved in. Uh, I can see that. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't see... I, I can't visualize it, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't see that it would be any better than, than what was done, but I know how to do the new version of Cooley High. Um, and uh, it, it would be a, a, quite a different story uh, because what happened as a result of that movie in Chicago is absolutely amazing. That, is a little known story, you know. Thank you. All right. Other things? Yeah. I'll, I'll just I hate to steal stuff. So I'm just curious, uh, the, from my perspective, it seems like right around 78, 79, the black film was sort of at a turning point, and you had two films that Universal did, The Wiz, and, and then your film was not a black film per se, but Sgt. Pepper's, where I think if, if they had Correct me if I'm wrong, do you think if they had been bigger financial successes, things might have opened up more for black film at that time? Because it seemed, or, there were, or, or were there other forces at work that sort of made it dip down until Crush Groove and Last Dragon? So. I think um, yeah, had Sgt. Pepper's been a bigger success, yeah, it, it would be a different story. The studio had really high hopes for it. Um, and the film uh, did incredible business overseas. It didn't do great business in the States or in, in England, um, primarily because people just, the diehard Beatle fans didn't like seeing um, uh, anybody pretending to be the Beatles, you know? Uh, but in the rest of the world, I, I, I had like a 2% of the producer's share. I made more money on that movie than, than three or four of my other movies uh, because he had the rest of the world rights, you know? Um, but if you look at the history of Hollywood and of black film in Hollywood, it, it's all, you're gonna see this kind of curve, you know? Um, that at a certain point, I, I call it the spigot gets shut off. Mm -hmm. And when I came in 
in Hollywood, the, the union doors were open and you saw more women on the studio lot. You saw more black faces on the studio lot. Four or five years later, those faces started to disappear, you know? Uh, and then a couple of years after that, it was all white again, yeah. you know? <laughs> and, and then, uh, then it, it started up. I mean, the, the whole black exploitation movement was a, a, a up curve where Hollywood discovered once again, oh, there's an audience that we can make some money on, right. you know? Right. Um, and, and then it opens the floodgates to the repeat. They produce the same story over and over again mm -hmm. in different flavors and, until it dies out. And then they say, well, nobody's interested in black anything. Right, you know? it swings the other yeah. way. Yeah. Can, can I ask a, a question? So, oh, so we have one more. I just want, uh, hey, thanks for coming, Michael. I wanted to ask about how important the soundtracks were to your movies. Uh, soundtracks, soundtracks, yeah, because mm -hmm. Car Wash and uh, Sergeant Peppers. Right. Um, and back you know, in the 70s, and especially the 70s, the soundtracks made the movies a lot of times. Oh, yeah. And, uh, well, the, the, the revenue from those as well. Exactly. Well, um, you know, Car Wash, I kind of um, modeled what Robert Altman was doing with Nashville. And, uh, of course, he didn't have the soundtrack that we had. <laughs> uh, but it was the first time, I think, in, in modern Hollywood history where the music was almost as important as the, the visual, as the film story, and where the studios realized that they could they could make their money on the music even if the film didn't do that well, right. you know? So they were willing to take more gambles mm -hmm. on stories that they wouldn't have before because, oh, we can sell the soundtrack. Right. It's promoting you know? the soundtrack. Right. But, um, you know, the, the soundtrack in, in my early films was critically important because I used the music as a way to also tell the story. So I had a, a question. So we've kind of looked at accomplishment, um, a number of great films and television accomplishment. Was there a point uh, in your career um, where, where you were faced or, or, or thought about giving it up in, in terms of kind of reaching a, a wall, in terms of getting your projects made? Um, not, no, not really giving it up, but uh, the, the failure of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band mm -hmm. um, to reach a broad American audience was a real yeah. disappointment. Right. And uh, so I went through a period of being depressed about that until I said to myself, get over it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> get over it and move on to the next you know, the next thing. Uh, okay. We have another one. I've watched um, The Last Dragon 25 to 50 times <laughs> because my kids loved it, and I, they had to watch it every week. Uh, they're in their third, late 30s now, and they're still quoting from it, and they'll be delighted to know that I found out who you are. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. No, that uh, Last Dragon was really phenomenal in the, in the sense that e even when we put it out, kids would, this is before DVDs and uh, VHSs, uh, they would come back and see the movie five, six times in, in the same week, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you'd hear them uh, in the stores quoting the one-liners. Um, and uh, it, it was just, great to see that and the story of that it was a first time screenwriter uh, who was a dancer in fame Louis Venosta was, was a dancer in fame and he was a martial arts uh, nut 
an aficionado. And so the only time you could see Bruce Lee movies was if you went to Chinatown in New York, you know, to certain theaters and you, you could see those movies and he'd come back and tell his girlfriend, you know, if there was only a black superhero martial artist, you know, and she, and she said, quit telling me that, just go write it yourself, you know? <laughs> and, and he went and wrote it, yeah. Yes, how are you, Michael? Um, Good. I, I just want to first of all commend you for the uh, impact that you've had for so many African Americans in Hollywood. Um, you know, your success over a long period of time and mentoring other artists and whatnot. So I want to commend you for that. Thank you. Also, you, you, you touched a little bit on international distribution. And I know for, you know, forever we've been told that our films don't travel and don't travel internationally. Do you find that there's a difference now today with, with so much material that's available? Has is, is that changed at all in terms of us being able to really be more successful in the international market? Um, you know, that whole story um, is basically a lie. Um, and when we did Car Wash, we went to, matter of fact, Sid Scheinberg um, uh, was involved in the film that we saw last night, uh, Jamal, um, Joseph. Jamal Joseph's, film? Uh, Joseph's film. Yeah, Sid, Sid Scheinberg was the president of Universal at the time. And um, uh, once the movie came out, once Car Wash came out, he said, this should be in the Cannes Film Festival. So, he got it in the Cannes Film Festival, and so we go to Cannes, and the European audience loved the movie. The jurors wanted to award it the Golden Palm, the Palm d'Or, you know, but there were two American critics on the jury who hated the movie, Rex Reed and, uh, and Pauline Kael. And all the Europeans are saying you're crazy. Saying they couldn't, they couldn't come up with a with a quorum, so they made up an award for the movie wow. uh, called Technical Excellence. So, <laughs> so Car Wash wins two awards at the Cannes Film Festival: one for the music and one for Technical Excellence, because the Europeans were so outraged that the Americans couldn't see what they saw. You know. Uh, so, I knew from the experience of car wash being in Europe that, and the kind of uh, attention that the film got everywhere in the world but Italy for some weird reason, <laughs> uh, that that lie about black material not working in, in foreign territories was not necessarily a deliberate lie on the part of the studios. What was going on was that the sub-distributors in these foreign territories would tell the studios there's no audience for it. Meanwhile, they're pocketing the money because it was in the days before computers and the studios couldn't track the money, so whoever put their hand on the money first <laughs> got the lion's share of it, you know. And so these uh, Lebanese theater distributors or whatever, you know, I, went, I, I was in uh, West Africa uh, shortly after Car Wash um, in Gabon, and there was a Fred Williamson movie and an Indian movie, and they were charging 12 American dollars for admission, right? Uh, and the theater was packed. And I, I looked at that and said, okay, <laughs> I, I understand the game. You know, they, a lot of people are making money on it. The studios don't think so because they're not getting any of it, and so they're, they're telling us there's no market. That has changed. So with the advent of all the new distribution outlets, there's a huge 
there, there's a huge interest in, in black culture, not just African-American culture. Um, when Hitler went through all those countries, he, he took as many black artifacts out of North Africa that he could and put them in a museum in, uh, in East Berlin, you know? Um, and um, we had an animation company and we did a graphic novel. A company in Germany picked it up, produced a beautiful graphic novel of it, sold it out immediately all over German-speaking Europe, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, our culture just uh, is infectious, and people, people want to be hip all over the world, you know? <laughs> so. Right. Thank you. Well, wow. really great, great discussion. We can maybe dialogue a little bit after. Um, yeah, yeah. So, Michael, I really want to thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you.